So, I picked a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam we want to study. It's, uh, can I share the screen or will you put the verse on, on the screen? I can put this verse on the screen. Okay, so Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, Chapter 5, verse number 9. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam namaskrityam naram chaiva narotamam daivim sarasatim vyasam tato jaya mudirayat nasta prayeshu vabhadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama shloke bhaktir bhavati naishtiki krishna svadamo bhagate dharma jnana devi sakalo nishta drishamesha puranarto dranodata so we're going to read shrimad bhagavatam first canto chapter 5 verse number 9 this is uh, narada muni giving instruction to shrila vyasa dev <coughs> on the importance of Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay, so we'll chant the Sanskrit here, text number nine. Dita dharma dayas chata muni varya nu kirtita natata vasudevasya mahima yanu varnita Right? Okay, so word meaning? Yata, as much as dharma adaya, all four principles of religious behavior. Oh. Cha and Artha. I, I can't see it. I always have problem with this because you put all these pictures on, down here on the side of the thing and it blocks the text. I don't know how to... Maharaj, you, uh, you have an option actually, it only been done by you that you can actually reduce all the pictures. How? What do I do? Where? You, there, is, there, there, is a, uh, there is a... There are two signs on the top where there's, a, there's like a... Uh, a a dash and a thing. If you click on the dash, all the pictures will go down. Where? Uh, I click on the dash. Uh, if you go on the okay, top, yeah, the I got it. I got it. Okay, I got it now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, Arta purposes, Muni Varya, by yourself, the great sage, Anukirtita, repeatedly described, na na tata, in that way. Vasudevasya of the personality of Godhead Sri Krishna, Mahima glories, he certainly, Anuvarnita, so constantly described. Translation and purport by Srila Prabhupada. Although, great sage, you have very broadly described the four principles beginning with religious performances. You have not described the glories of the Supreme Personality, Vasudev. Purport. The prompt diagnosis of Sri Narada is at once declared. The root cause of the despondency of Vyasadev was his deliberate av avoidance of glorifying the Lord by his various editions of the Puranas. He has certainly, as a matter of course, given descriptions of the glories of the Lord, Sri Krishna, but not as many as given to religiosity, economic development, sense gratification and salvation. These four items are by far inferior to engagement in the devotional service of the Lord. Sri Vyasadeva, as the authorized scholar, knew very well this difference. And still, instead of giving more importance to the better type of engagement, 
namely devotional service to the Lord, he more or less improperly used his, his valuable time, and thus he was despondent. From this, it is clearly indicated that no one can be pleased substantially without being engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita, this fact is clearly mentioned. After liberation, which is the last item in the line of performing religiosity, etc., one is engaged in pure devotional service. This is called the stage of self-realization or the Brahmabhuta stage. After attainment of this Brahmabhuta stage, one is satisfied. But satisfaction is the beginning of transcendental bliss. One should progress by attaining neutrality and equality in the relative world. And passing this stage of equanimity, one is fixed in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. This is the instruction of the Personality of Godhead in the Bhagavad Gita. The conclusion is that in order to maintain the status quo of the Brahmabhuta stage, as also to increase the degree of transcendental realization, Narad re re recommended to Vyasadeva that he, Vyasadeva, should now eagerly and repeatedly describe the path of devotional service. This would cure him from gross despondency. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Guru Shri Yatapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sokrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dhina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Ghoravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanhebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Translation again Although great sage you have very broadly described the four principles beginning with religious performance. You have not described to such an extent the glories of the Supreme Personality, Vasudeva. Okay, so Narada Muni is instructing his disciple, Srila Vyasadeva. Narada is very fortunate. He's got so many wonderful disciples, and Prabhu Srila Vyasadeva is the most wonderful of his disciples. Because Srila Vyasadeva takes up the work of 
being spiritual master and he's there in the parampara and the disciplic succession. And we're so much indebted to Srila Vyasadeva for compiling all the Vedic literatures, for writing everything down for us in this Kali Yuga. Srila Vyasadeva was aware of our uh, shortcomings, of our poor qualities, our bad memories particularly. Therefore, everything's written down for us. However, he's got himself in a little difficulty here because after writing so many books, meaning having the Vedas written down and dividing them into four and then writing the supplements to the Vedas in the form of the Puranas for the different modes of nature and then also Mahabharata containing Bhagavad Gita. He had written so many books but he's feeling despondency. He's feeling some lacking. And I think all of us, we've had that experience of despondency. You know, you try very hard, you try to do something really nice, you want to please people, you really work hard trying to do something. Maybe it's in your job, or maybe it's with the family, or with your community, whatever. Sometimes, you, you know, you're trying, <laughs> you're trying to please people, but somehow you, you just end up feeling despondent that something's wrong. Maybe, maybe, I, I, maybe I've forgotten something. So certainly Srila Vyasadeva had forgotten something in, in, in some ways. It was definitely a problem that he'd, he'd forgotten to emphasize the position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He'd written wonderful books, very nice grammar, wonderful Sanskrit poetry, beautiful slokas, but he ended up putting more emphasis on the path of the uh, religious performances, what we would call the karmakanda activities, uh, dharma, artha, kama, moksha the purusha, the four goals of material life. People in material world were very much concerned with these things, right? People like to be a little pious, do a little mundane material religion. In the West, they go to the church on Sunday. In other places, you know, maybe some people like fasting on Tuesday or break a coconut on Friday, go to the temple on Friday night, break a coconut, these kind of things, you know, mundane religious activities according to the tradition. Uh, and we're performing these things, this, this religion, for the sake of our own material prosperity. That by being pious and being religious, one will get artha, economic development. Of course, this is what all the politicians are planning. They're all promising that our country is going to develop economically. We're going to have a good economy. You just believe me. Just keep working. Just keep going. Very soon, <coughs> very soon you're going to get it. Very, very soon we're going to you're going to be able to experience or you're going to see the prosperity of our nation or of our company. Everything will become wonderful. Promises are always there. It's like dangling the carrot in front of the donkey. The donkey's going for the carrot and the donkey goes forward to get the carrot, but the carrot also goes forward. So in the same way, modern day politicians are are very much like that. They dangle a, a carrot in front of us and promise many things. And people are eager to get the carrot and they go forward. So we work hard to get economic development. And then when the economic development comes, then what happens? Then it's used for arta, for sense gratification. We don't know how to make proper use of economic development. We think it's for our sense gratification. People are very much eager 
for sense gratification. They think that's the goal of life. For materialistic people, that's the mood. Prabhupada told, talked about uh, Charvaka Muni, the atheist. He said his philosophy was bag, borrow, or steal, but eat ghee. <laughs> eat ghee. That's the best thing for the stomach. This is a good taste, you know. So people in material life, they want economic development for satisfying the senses. We want to, we think, I will live more comfortably. I was in England when Srila Prabhupada came there one time, I remember, and this one very aristocratic gentleman came. He had been engaged in the government service in India for some years. So he had experience of life in India working for the British government. So he came to meet Prabhupada and Prabhupada asked him, so what is your goal of life? So the man thought for a minute, he thought, he said, well, I will die peacefully. <laughs> the Prabhupada laughed. He said, oh really, you will die peacefully. You know, this, this is the thinking of materialistic people in their old age, they're thinking, I will die peacefully. Prabhupada said, it's, it's, not very, it's not really peaceful when you die. We have to know how to prepare for death. We have to know how to prepare for leaving this human form of life. This is really the mission of human life. But people are blinded by sense gratification. They think the goal of life is to enjoy and live comfortably and die peacefully. <laughs> so, Krishna Consciousness is teaching us something different. Krishna Consciousness is teaching us how to get out of this wheel of birth and death. The goal of life is not simply sense gratification, but we have to learn to res restrain the senses, to control the senses, not to just simply satisfy the senses, because senses are never satisfied. This is something we have to learn, that you never satisfy the senses. And it's very hard to satisfy other people also. You work in a big company, very hard to satisfy the bosses, very hard to satisfy the family members. It's very hard to please people in material life. And it's even hard to satisfy our own senses. Our own mind and senses are never satisfied. We always want more. You may make some money, you make a lot of money, and then you think, I will make more money. It's material life. So the Vedas, of course, they prescribe Dharma, Artha, Kama, Artha, Kama, Kama sense gratification, and then moksha. That you sh the idea is that the Vedas were giving instruct how to, how to achieve material prosperity, and then after sense gratification, then you want to give it up, and you should think about liberation, moksha. How to get out from the material world. So Vyasa Dev had written a lot about these things. Of course, we know in our chanting of Hare Krishna, the eighth offense is there. To consider chanting Hare Krishna one of the auspicious ritualistic activity offered in the Vedas as karma kanda or fruit of activity. This is the illusion. We're thinking chanting Hare Krishna will give us some material piety. Chanting Hare Krishna is not for that. That's an offense to think like that. Rather, our chanting Hare Krishna is meant be, to be done in the mood of devotion, devotional service for the pleasure of Krishna. We call the name of Krishna to attract the attention of Krishna. And if we're so fortunate to get the attention of Krishna, we don't want to just simply ask him for sense gratification. That is foolish. That is for the less intelligent people. 
less intelligent people generally will not worship Krishna because they know that it's not so easy to please Krishna. And Krishna is not so eager to satisfy our senses. Krishna thinks they're asking me for poison. Better I give them something, give them nectar. But if you worship other gods, then they're easy to please. They will give you the poison if you want. If that's what you ask for, they'll give it to you. They'll let you take it. But Krishna is more kind. He's more thoughtful. He thinks, why should I give them poison? Let me give them the real nectar. So Srila Vyasadeva should have understood the need to glorify the performance of devotional service. When he was writing all of his books, he should have properly emphasized the importance of Lord Krishna, Vasudeva. He should have given the, the real emphasis on the path of devotion, not on these material activities. Of course, we could say, well, he was writing about the other modes, you know, glorifying the other modes. But the principle is there. You, you want to do something, why confuse people? People may come and say, well, Srila Vyasadeva wrote this. Srila Vyasadeva said like this. Yes, Srila Vyasadeva did say it, but he said so many other things also. You should understand what was Srila Vyasadeva's writing in his maturity. What was his mature contribution, his mature realization? And that is given in the form of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the ripened fruit of all of the Vedas. That is the Srila Vyasadeva in his maturity. Just like Shankaracharya, at the time of leaving his body, what did Shankaracharya say? He said, Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda, Bhaja Govinda Mudhamate. Right? He said, oh, you fools, you rascals. He said, just worship Govinda. Don't spend your time speculating and playing with words, but simply worship Govinda. All of your word jugglery and mental speculation will do you no good at the time of death. So that was Shankaracharya at the end of life. And we see Srila Vyasadeva also. Of course, Srila Vyasadeva, he is still in this world, but he is in recluse. He is in the Himalayas, and he's waiting for the end of Kali Yuga. And at the end of Kali Yuga, he will come back again, and he has some function in the Satya Yuga, after this Kali Yuga ends. But before he retired to the Himalayas, he wrote all of his wonderful books. And his mature realization is there in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. And that Srimad Bhagavatam was instructed to him by Srila Narada Muni, his spiritual master. Srila Narada Muni wanted him to properly glorify the process of devotional service. And Srila Vyasadeva had already written Vedanta Sutra, of course. Now, Vedanta Sutra is very popular. So many people like to read the Vedanta Sutra. I, I remember attending a book fair in India one time, a very big book fair, and we had a booth for the Bhakti Vedanta Book Trust, and people were coming, and time after time people would ask, I want Vedanta Sutra. You know, they'd all heard of Vedanta Sutra and they had some interest to read Vedanta Sutra. But the Vedanta Sutra is not so easy to understand because it's a, well, it's a sutra, first of all. For one thing, it means it's very condensed, just like condensed milk. You cook the milk down, you boil off all the water. So the sut everything's in a sutra form, very brief, not so easy. To understand, of course, for the for the followers of Sri Shankaracharya, that is their mission. That is their whole business. That they have to spend their time studying Vedanta Sutra. And Srila Vyasadeva wrote this Vedanta Sutra, but still he was despondent after he wrote Vedanta Sutra. 
So how did he overcome his despondency? The cure to his despondency came in the glorification of Lord Krishna and the process of devotional service. The medicine for his despondency. He got sick because he wrote Vedanta Sutra. He wasn't satisfied by writing Vedanta Sutra. Mayavadi sannyasis and big impersonalists, jnanis, they like to study Vedanta Sutra and they get nowhere. They will simply end up like Srila Vyasadeva, despondent. But they're, in a, they're not as fortunate as Vyasadeva. They don't have Narada Muni to come to them, to guide them and tell them what they need to do. But they should learn from Srila Vyasadeva that the solution to his despondency was in glorifying the Supreme Lord. And Srila Vyasadeva did this by compiling the Srimad Bhagavatam. It is the Srimad Bhagavatam which is the ripened fruit of all of the Vedas. And it describes all the topics of Lord Krishna, beginning with creation, Shristi Tattva, right? Shristi Tattva. How does the Lord create? We want to understand Lord Krishna. We should first of all understand his potencies, how he has inconceivable potency. He, is, he possesses achincha shakti. He can perform inconceivable, wonderful activities. And he does that in the way, by way of creation. And how does he create? How does this world actually come about? We can learn that from Srimad Bhagavatam. It is all described. Sukadeva Goswami, in, in Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, Sukadeva Goswami, the son of Srila Vyasadeva, describes the process of creation. He was requested, he want, with the Maharaj Parikshit desire to understand how creation comes about. So it's described there. Sukhdev Goswami offers his prayers before describing the process of creation. But the Lord is not only a creator. The Lord is the supreme enjoyer. And he enjoys wonderful transcendental activities with his devotees. But he also incarnates. He, he has many different expansions and incarnations to perform many other activities which go on throughout the universe. So all of this is described in Srimad Bhagavatam. The sages in Naimisharanya who were gathered there in Naimisharanya understanding the onset of Kali Yuga. They were seeking guidance. They, want, they had questions. They wanted to know, Lord Krishna is gone. Where, where are the religious principles to be found now? So long as Krishna was on the planet, we knew that he is the personification of religion. But now that he's gone, where, is, where are they to be found? And of course, the answer was given by Sutta Goswami, that the Srimad Bhagavatam is as br brilliant as the sun, and it has arisen just after the departure of Lord Krishna for his own abode. Persons who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of this age of Kali will get light from the Purana, this Purana. From this Purana, not from all the, any, just any Puranas, there are many Puranas, but from this Purana, this Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavat Purana, which is the cream of all the Puranas. So we, we have to emphasize this uh, process of devotional service and the glories of Lord Krishna. And in the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is properly explained. Srila Prabhupada says in one purport, say, simply by studying the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam, one day you will see Krishna there on the page of Srimad Bhagavatam. I don't know what, you know, when I read Srimad Bhagavatam on my computer, I hope Krishna can also appear one day in, in my computer. Krishna is everywhere. Why not? Krishna has a chincha shakti. He can do anything. He can appear anywhere. For Prahlad Maharaj, he came from the pillar to pick up 
the earth from the bottom of the universe, he came from the nostril of Brahma. So the Lord has inconceivable potencies, he can perform wonderful activities. We have to hear about the Lord and his activities, we have to become attached to hearing the glories of the Lord. If we simply hear about the path of karma kandi, karma kanda, that is not good. We become attached to artha and kama, economic development and sense gratification. People never get beyond sense gratification. They never even think about liberation these days. They don't worry about dharma either. All they want is the artha and the kama. The rest of it, that's not very important for the materialistic people. All they're interested in, economic development and sense gratification. This is the animal business. Lord Rishabdev told his sons, Nayam deho deha bajam niraloke kushtam kamarnahate vidbujam ye. Lord Rishabdev was preparing to retire as Vanaprastha and enter the forest to do austerities. But before he did so, he instructed his sons. He had a hundred sons, wonderful sons. Among them, Bharat Maharaj, and then also the nine Yogendras. So very wonderful son. And Lord Rishabdi is telling them, don't waste this human life just to have sense gratification. Because that is available even for the, the animals like the pigs and the dogs which eat stool. Human life is not meant for sense gratification like the hogs and the dogs. Human life is meant for Tejo divyam putrakayena sattvam shudayad jasmad brahmashokyam twanantam. Lord Rishabdi says, human life is meant for undergoing a little austerity. We have to control the mind and senses. If we control the mind and senses, then we will go on to experience real pleasure. We want to get, you want sense gratification, you want pleasure, you want happiness, it's there. You can get it, but you have to be willing to do a little austerity. And that austerity is controlling the mind and senses, re restraining the, the senses from sinful activities. Of course, this is very difficult for materialistic people, but with proper education, with proper guidance, it is possible. We are seeing nowadays with this COVID, people are being forced to accept a little more austerity. They have to, they have, they're, they're forced to accept a little austerity. They can't just go on with their sinful activities, with their sense gratification. They have to control. And when they control the mind and senses, then they get purified and they can experience, go on to experience real pleasure. So in Srila Prabhupada's purport, he talks about how Srila Vyasadeva had emphasized, he, you know, his, his emphasis was not correct. He should have been emphasizing devotional service, but he said, instead he gave importance to the karmakandi activities. So Prabhupada said the path of devotional service is always mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. That in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said that simply by following the Vedas, you're not going to get real happiness. Krishna says, Trigunya Vishaya Veda, nice Trigunya Bhavarjuna, Nirvanvo Nidvasatvaso, Nir Yoga Shema Atmava. Krishna is telling Arjuna, rise above the modes of material nature, O Arjuna. The modes of nature, the, the, the Vedas deal with the modes of nature. We should rise above them. Why? Because the modes of nature mean actions and reactions. You're performing activities, you're going to get reactions from these activities. And these reactions are not all pleasant. You're also going to get some miseries. Just like there's a lot of suffering in the world. Why? 
the reactions from our past sins. We're all suffering. Material world. This world is Dukalaya, right? Mama Pecha Punarjan Mat Dukalaya Mashasvatam. Krishna said, those great souls who are yogis in devotion, they never return to this world because they know it to be a temporary place of misery. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, rise above the modes, Arjuna, be transcendental to all of them. Because the modes are not going to give you real happiness. Some little happiness with a lot of suffering. So then Srila Prabhupada goes on to speak about coming to the point of liberation. It's a, it is liberation, the mukti. That's the last item of the four. Dharma, artha, kama, moksha. We think about people, be, if they're fortunate, they may think about liberation. And that's the last principle of material religiosity. And from liberation, then one can be, become self. This is this self-realization. In Bhagavad Gita, it is described as Brahma Bhuta. We actually know that we're not the body, that we're Brahman. So we have to come to that platform of understanding our spiritual identity to transcend the material designations. Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma one who knows that they're not the body, who understands their Brahman, he's a joyful soul. Actually, there's no real happiness in Brahman, but there's no suffering. Brahman is simply the absence of suffering. There's no real spiritual bliss in Brahman. The bliss is beyond, you have to go beyond Brahman to get the real bliss. And Prabhupada makes that point in the purport here. He talks that self-realization is the Brahma Bhutta stage. For the impersonalist, that's the goal. They simply want realization of the Brahman. And they're happy, they're satisfied with that. They don't want to go any, they don't know any further. They think that's the highest. Sankaracharya gave importance to the statement in the Vedas, Sarvam Kauvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. So they think only about the Brahman and they don't understand that Lord Krishna is para-Brahman. They think Lord Krishna is also Brahman. They confuse Lord Krishna with ordinary living entities. They are not aware of Lord Krishna's transcendental position and his dominion over all that be. So Srila Prabhupada talks about coming to the Brahma Bhutta stage, one will, can be satisfied. We're not going to be satisfied in material life, but you come to the Brahman, there's some satisfaction there. Just like one, one may come to the platform of Atmarama, taking pleasure in the self, taking pleasure on this and within. So there's some satisfaction there. There's relief from suffering. That's the main point. No suffering. We want spiritual satisfaction that there is also higher pleasures. There's that param jisva. In Bhagavad Gita we hear how the embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, but the taste for sense pleasure remains. However, ceasing such pleasure, he experiences a higher taste and can be fixed in consciousness. Ceasing such pleasure by experiencing a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. We want to get the higher taste to actually be fixed in consciousness. And the higher taste comes when we engage in devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting. So Prabhupada mentioned this, this satisfaction is the beginning of transcendental bliss. So there is some element of satisfaction in the Brahma Bhutta stage. We are free from misery, no more suffering. Wow, that is a relief. Huh? That is something to be satisfied. It means no more suffering, but no real happiness also. Liberation, the stage of liberation 
for the impersonalist is simply negation of all activities because impersonalists imagine that all activities are material. So they want to negate all activity, to stop all activity. So they, they come to the platform of Brahman. Srila Prabhupada then said, one should progress in attaining neutrality and equality in the relative world. Brahma Buddha Prasanatma Nasuchati Nakanchati not hankering or lamenting for anything. Samasarveshu Bhuteshu, seeing all living entities equally. Right? Attaining neutrality, being neutral. One of uh, my devotee friends works in the corporate industry and he was telling me how, you know, he, he'd done a lot of hard work in his company and brought in a lot of customers and good sales turnover really did well, but still what happened was they brought in a younger man, much, much, quite a bit younger, like 10 years younger than him and junior, and they put him as his senior, they put him as his supervisor. And so it was quite discouraging for him. He felt, you know, really a bit bitter about it. But <laughs> when he was expressing his resentment at home, his, his children said to him, Oh, come on, Dad, that's not the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna teaches us in the Bhagavad Gita, we have to be neutral to these things, to the actions and reactions of the material nature. Yeah, it's easy said, <laughs> not so easy to do. Anyway, when he heard that from his children, it was really encouraging to him. And he, he took that neutral stance. And so it was very nice when the family are there to help you with these difficulties. We do have these difficulties with, in the material world. It is natural. We have attachments to people. And at the same time, we have... Uh, we can have bitterness or bad feelings towards some people. Some, somebody's high class, somebody's low class, somebody's black, somebody's white, somebody's rich, somebody's poor, you know, and because of all these things, we don't see always equality. We don't see an equal, with an equal vision. We make distinctions. It's really not the Bhagavad Gita. What to speak of among human beings, we should see all living entities equally. The ants here in India, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly fighting against ants, trying to keep the ants out of my room. They keep wanting to share my room with me. So many of them as well. <laughs> I should remember, they're also spirit souls. I see also the birds here in Mayapur, they're building nests in our building. They come and build a nest and they think, why should I build my nest in the tree? When it rains, I get so wet. So they, build, they come and build the nest in our, in our building. <laughs> so we should be equal, we should share our building with these creatures, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think Prabhupada would like it very much. Anyway, these are issues, neutrality, equality. We should try to develop that kind of mood. This is coming to the transcendental stage. And then Prabhupada says, passing this stage of equanimity, one is fixed in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. This is the instruction of the personality of Godhead in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, Brahma Buddha Prasanatma Nasochati Nakanchati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Madbhakti Mlabhate Param. Right? So, first of all, Brahma Buddha, we have to detach from this body, knowing we're not the body, we're spirit soul, and we should be joyful. Prabhupada had one servant, and he was. All, he was very morose, miserable. Prabhupada told him, he said, you cannot be in Krishna consciousness if you are morose. So, devotees, we should be prasan atma. We should be joyful souls. Mayavadis, impersonalists, they don't 
really like that. They're not in favor of being joyful. They, they think that's emotional. They often condemn our devotees, oh, very emotional people, chanting and dancing, singing, expressing themselves. You know, they like chanting Hare Krishna, but they do it very soberly. You know, sit down and very care carefully chanting. I, I was in uh, a, Buddh a Buddhist country, Taiwan, and we were having a program, we were doing kirtan, and there were some nice young Buddhist monks there, and I was preaching to them. They were very nice, they were interested in Krishna consciousness. So we had a kirtan, and they sat and listened to the kirtan. So then I invited them, come dance with us, you know, you can also dance. But, oh no, no, we can't do that. You know, they're Buddhists. Buddhists, they cannot dance, they cannot make any show of emotion. Similarly, impersonalist Mayavadis, no, no emotion, be completely neutral, means no bliss, no spiritual bliss, no real pleasure on, on the transcendental platform. So their realization is very dry and limited. And that's why the impersonalists often fall back to the material world. Hmm. As Lord Brahma said, because of their impure intelligence, the Avishuddha Buddha Yo, they come back into the material world and again take up some, usually take up some mundane welfare activity. They may open a school, education, they may open a library or an old people's home or a hospital, whatever. They do these kind of things because they don't really know about spiritual in activities. They have no experience of spiritual engagement. That is devotional service, beginning with hearing and chanting. We have to learn how to engage yourself on the transcendental platform, utilizing our mind and senses in the service of Krishna. And we can experience the bliss. Krishna Consciousness is a very dynamic experience. Go on chanting and dancing, we can feel the pleasure of Krishna Consciousness. We want to do it more and more. I spent a little while just the other day hearing one devotee, you know, our, uh, our uh, strategic planning team are organizing so many different speakers on the internet. So I was listening to the one devotee, Ram Rai, a disciple of, I think His Holiness Sasvarupa Goswami, and he's from New York, and he's leading a group of devotees who go out in New York in the, in, and they perform Harinam Sankirtan. And they, they often, you know, wintertime weather's not very pleasant, and New York can be cold and very windy, bitter and so they sometimes they go in the subway also sit in the subway and they'll spend the whole day there they'll spend 15 hours sometimes there 17 hours in a day they're chanting the holy name and they're they're very happy they're in ecstasy and people come and join them they, they have a you know it's like an open program it's just sometimes they're in the park in the Union, Union Square Park sometimes in Tompkins Square Park, where Prabhupada began Krishna consciousness. And they go there and they chant, and they'll spend the whole day, every day, that's their program, to go and chant the holy name. And people come and join, they just love it, you know, they say, oh, this is so nice, I'm experiencing so much pleasure. So, we have this program also, like in Vrindavan, there's eternal kirtan going on. Even here in Mayapur we have also 24-hour kirtan. It's not quite as popular as in Vrindavan, but it does go on. So New York, big city, Prabhupada started the Krishna consciousness movement there. And it's, it's very wonderful to see the devotees are continuing the Sankirtan movement there. We want to do Sankirtan everywhere, every home. Right? If you can't go out, then just do it at home. Do some kirtan at home, sit with the family, chant the holy name. And we, if you do it regularly, more and more you'll feel the bliss. 
you appreciate it. This is the real nectar for which we are always anxious. So Srila Vyasadeva brought this out in the Srimad Bhagavatam. We are very grateful to him for giving us the Srimad Bhagavatam. Let me see how am I doing. Oh. Okay, maybe we'll stop here and ask if there's any questions. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So there are some questions. Uh, so can I, because that, that they are in the chat box, so I... Hare Krishna. Hare so Maharaj... You want yeah, me to open? Uh, you want me to open the chat? question is, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, how think devotee in a job in Gulf? Yes. Go ahead. Hare Krishna. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. Can you speak it again, please? So the question is, how a, how a practice uh, in Gulf, uh, doing a job for money, can go beyond the three modes of material nature? How to go beyond the three modes of material nature when you're working in a job? You have to have a proper sadhana. You have to have a daily program. You wake up in the morning and you have some program to chant the holy name and to study the scriptures and maybe to worship the deity. This will help you very much to overcome the modes of not, not just getting up and going to work, but waking up and get, taking bath, putting on tea light, and your work is just, it's just material. It's, you're just in, under the modes of nature. You have no hope. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yeah, Maharaj, it was breaking of your video, so it's better now. I mean, yeah, this, the, the you know, internet is sort of unstable internet is here, yeah, Mayapur. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, sometimes practicing devotees misunderstands the Krishna conscious philosophy and they don't give much importance to work, job and family. Uh, uh, so, how to come out of this wrong understanding? Oh, th yeah, this is very wrong. Yeah, we have to have a balance between the two. The Krishna conscious person must take care of his family. And taking care of the family means you need a job. You have, to, you have to maintain your job. One who is Krishna conscious devotee, he should, work, he should be a very responsible and uh, caring worker. The people in the company should respect him that he is very conscientious, he does a good job, and we, you know, we've learned, we've learned to respect him. So, the one who is a devotee of Krishna will also be very much concerned for his family, looking after the children and wife and like that. Of course, caring for them means also helping them in Krishna consciousness. If you don't take care of them, then the family will grow up to hate Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we seem like that, that the family have a very wrong impression of Krishna consciousness. They don't, they don't like our movement because it's broken up the family. It's, it's disturbing the family, the family, uh, the atmosphere in the family and their family relationships are all threatened due to Krishna consciousness. So our family relationships should be nourished by Krishna consciousness, it should be strengthened. Thank you, Maharaj. So, Maharaj, uh, next, next question is similar, uh, in the similar lines. They are asking that um, it is our pleasure to serve our parents, especially in their old age, but the problem is that they are, uh, they are on a material platform and not spiritual platform. 
So for serving them, we have to sacrifice our devotional activities sometimes. So how to manage these situations? Yes, it's very much regretted that sometimes the people in the family, the older parents, they don't have that appreciation for Krishna consciousness. Uh, you have to be tolerant and encourage them and try to bring them to the temple, try to get them uh, a little bit more pious and religious, try to give, bring, them to the ha bring them to the temple, let them see the deities and even meet some devotees. And dealing with elderly parents is definitely a great challenge because they're accustomed to giving the children instruction and they don't like to take instruction from the children. You know, it's a, it was a bit different for Devahuti. Devahuti could hear from Lord Kapila because she was told that her son is an incarnation of God. However, you know, we're not incarnations of God. We try to instruct our parents. It's difficult. We have to deal very cautiously, very carefully with them, very respectfully with them, and just simply try to encourage them to take a little interest in Krishna consciousness. The fact that they're your parents indicate they must be elderly in the body and they have to understand that death is not far away. In old age, we have to prepare for death. We have to think about death, that we're going to die. Where are we going to go? So even in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions about how in older age people will become more serious about liberation. So we have to try to gently, delicately try to awaken this understanding within our parents, within the elders in the home, to try to get them to be more thoughtful and understand that they, you know, they need to think about death, that death is coming, where are they going to go next life, are they ready? And generally, of course, you know, if Indian people, Hindu, they believe in reincarnation, they know about Yamaraj and all these things, so they have to really think about it. They, they should want to do some devotional service before they leave the body. Even meat eating and things like that, people are habit, habituated to these things. But in old age, we see how the body breaks down, how it can no longer function so well. The power of digestion goes, people cannot properly digest these things, so they should be encouraged to have a more vegetarian diet. It's just simply for their own health, will save them from a lot of trouble. They, they say, well, I like, the, I like meat, I want the taste of meat. We have to learn how to cook. And Prabhupada could cook very nicely. Prabhupada went to America, practically nobody was a vegetarian, but Prabhupada cooked such nice prasadam, everyone liked it. Everyone was appreciating the prasadam. They were very happy. Not that they were vegetarian, but they enjoyed the prasadam. So if one is a, a good cook, then you can attract also your elders, the elder members, that they can also take a more vegetarian diet. Yeah, you have to be careful, you have to be delicate in dealing with them. They don't like it, it's a change. But still, you have to be determined. You have to, you have to tell them that this is what I'm doing. If you want to do it, if you don't want to do it, then I'm, I cannot help you. I cannot really, I cannot, I'm not going to encourage you with your sinful things. All right? Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, this one question uh, from a young boy from our congregation. Uh, he's asking uh, that, um, you know, Maharaj, can you please tell us how you came to Krishna consciousness, Krishna consciousness and what inspired you to take up Krishna consciousness so seriously? Oh, well, I came to Krishna consciousness really after purchasing one book. I purchased a Krishna book from a, a store in London. 
And when I took it home and showed my friend, he had another book also by Prabhupada. So I was very impressed because I'd already knew about Krishna from, from the devotees coming to England and they made the recording of the Hare Krishna mantra and the Govinda song. So I liked that music very much. I was very attracted to the music of the Hare Krishna mantra and the Govinda song. And after getting the book, then, and seeing the books, then I went to the temple. And when I went to the temple, I met the devotees and I was very impressed with all the devotees. You know, they were all, at that time I was very young and they were also about my age and even younger, some of them. But they were all so enthusiastic and dedicated and every night, I, I used to go to the temple every night and for arti and then we would have kirtan, we would have wonderful kirtan, dancing and chanting and I, I started to go to arti every night and I, I just became so attracted. So they, t they told me, they said, you know, why don't you stay overnight with us? We have a morning program. So I was staying overnight and then I would go to work. I had a job. I graduated from university and I was working in a job in London. So I went to my job and I would come home at night and take prasadam and every morning have a little morning program and then go to work. But then uh, what happened one day, the, he, the devotee told me, he said, you know, you give up this job, you don't need this job, just give up this job, you should be here. And so I thought, okay, yeah, I'll give up my job. So. <laughs> I mean, jobs, you know, you can always find another job. Often you have to find another job. That's, you know, jobs are not eternal. And so anyway, the devotee told me, he said, give up the job, come and be here. So I gave up the job and I, I, I became full-time in the temple. And, I, and then I began to, they, they put me in charge of uh, an incense business. We were making our own incense. Before I became a devotee, I used to purchase the incense. And then I became a devotee, I was in charge of the incense business. And it was pretty much maintaining our temple in those days. We didn't have any income. But we'd sell some incense and bottle some oils and make a little money, just enough to maintain the temple. We were about 20 people there in London when I joined. About 20, it was a small temple and it was a rented property. We were paying rent. We, so we were struggling, we didn't have money, <laughs> Different, interesting days, but very, very joyful days, very happy, a lot of dancing and chanting, and people were joining regularly, more and more people were coming. And then later on, George Harrison donated the Bhaktivedanta Manor also, so things happened by the grace of Krishna. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thanks a lot. Uh, now I'll request uh, His Grace Samit Prabhu from Altari Desh uh, to say the vote of thanks. Samit Prabhu. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, on behalf of Balram Desh and Altari Desh, uh, our leaders have asked me to present a vote of thanks to you. So Maharaj, it is our extremely, extremely great fortune to have you today on this wonderful Srimad Bhagavatam class and a very important chapter of Narada's instruction on Srimad Bhagavatam for Srila Vyasdev. And you very, very nicely, Maharaj, uh, described that how uh, Narad Muni gives instruction to Vyasdev to broadcast the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he has already described about religiosity, economic development, sense gratification and salvation. And you also very nicely, Maharaj, for all of us told that how we should be satisfied as satisfi satisfaction is the beginning of the transcendental bliss and how gradually one should attain the stage of equanimity and also get fixed in loving transcendental service of the Lord, which is the stage of Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma and how we should transcend the material mode of nature. Also, you very nicely said, Maharaj, that uh, we cannot be in Krishna consciousness if we are morose. A devotee is always prasannatma, he is always joyful. Uh, and uh, also you described very nicely about monistic, impersonalist philosophy that they don't have any bliss because they don't experience the devotional uh, bliss because they are not serving, they are not engaged in service of Krishna. It was a very wonderful point. 
and uh, while question answer session maharaj you also very nicely told that how we should have proper sadhana uh, balance in our life and also take care of our parents and how krishna consciousness is a dynamic process and we want to do more more maharaj one point which really touched my heart today uh, by your grace is you said that i am reading bhagavatam on my screen on my and i believe that krishna is also manifesting on my computer this is such a wonderful point maharaj you said that krishna is so great he can manifest anywhere which was very very nice point maharaj so as we say that great turn the you know every place into place of pilgrimage so i'm just thinking maharaj that you have turned this zoom platform because platform in uh, is also known as vedi uh, you know fire sacrifice sacrificial uh, platform so this come in the platform and we are so fortunate maharaj to hear you and have your association uh, on on this day so we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to you uh, by chanting hare krishna maha mantra and thanking you maharaj hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare my mother is also okay. mother's well yeah nice to see your mother yeah very good hare krishna hare krishna thank you prabhu thank you so much very kind हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण थैंक यू